conflict, even among believers, is inevitable, whether it's a debate on Twitter or a discussion at the dinner table. Today on Truth For Life Weekend, Alistair Begg helps us think through a biblical response to debates and divisions. We're learning how to stand firm for truth without being sucked into every controversy. Alistair is teaching in the book of Titus, but he begins with a helpful passage from 1 Timothy. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things. These things which he comes back to in the final sentence of verse 8, which he says are excellent and profitable for everyone. These are the things, these gospel things. And these things are in direct contrast to the false teachers who are actually unprofitable and useless. And for your homework again, you can go back and read from about verse 10 on in chapter 1 and you will discover that he is making that point very clearly concerning these folks. It's not unique to Titus. He does the same thing when he writes to Timothy. And for example, in verse 7 of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, he says, "...some have wandered away from these and turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm." Now, Titus, I don't want you to be like that. I want your ministry to be marked by something different. And his language, that is Paul's language, conveys the necessity of clarity and of certainty and of authority. I'll leave those words with you. I needn't work them out. Clarity in laying out the nature of the gospel itself, a la verses 4 to 7. Certainty in the way in which Titus, if you like, stands before his group or moves among his group so that the trumpet is not giving an uncertain sound, and authority, which is not an authority that derives from Titus's personality, but an authority which derives from that which Titus conveys to his people, namely the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, here he says, is what I want you to stress. Then he says, and here is why I want you to stress it. So that. It's a purpose clause in Greek and in English. I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Now, I don't think he would have been upset to think that many of the people were taking notes or wrote down some of these great quotes that uh, he had. Uh, Titus was able to quote somebody far better than B.B. Warfield. He was able to quote the Apostle Paul himself. He was able to say, we've had a letter from the mighty Apostle Paul, and I want to read it out to you. Quite wonderful. But he doesn't say, and the reason I'm stressing this for you, congregation, this morning here in Crete, is so that you might all become theological eggheads so that you might all be able to walk around and impress everybody with the grasp that you have of all of these things. Your grasp will be revealed in your life. And indeed, the impact in the community will be seen in goodness. And the goodness will be the evidence of the fact that you have been grasped by God in his kindness. And so, again, the recurring emphasis. Who are these people and what are they like? Well, I want you to make sure that they get a hold of this, Titus, so that they might be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Uh, We cannot evade this challenge, loved ones. it, it, It just hits me like a hammer to say it to you. Careful every morning. Here's an opportunity. Lord, I'm going out into my day. I'm going into my normal place of employment. I just studied Titus, and apparently, as I go out, one of the things that I have to be very careful to ensure happens is I want to be careful uh, to do good. I want to be kind. I want to be engaged. I want to be courteous. I want to be loyal. I want to be humble. And Lord, as you know, because I haven't even got out of my bed yet, and I've sinned my soul four times, as you know, 
There is no possibility of me looking into myself and saying, well, I'm ready to be good today. After all, I'm such a courteous, humble, uh, community-engaging kind of person. No, I am a wretched sinner, Lord. And apart from the dynamic of the gospel, which give, assures me of my acceptance with you, the living God, and by the renewing power of the Holy Spirit in my life, I don't have a, I have, I don't have a hope in the world of being anything other than a miserable sinner out there. Because there are a lot of miserable Christian sinners, aren't there? It's, 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 it's very distressing when our friends tell us, you know, that Mr. So-and-so, uh, who, who is uh, a complete outright pagan, who tells all the dirty jokes, is a much nicer person than Mr. So-and-so, who claims to be a born-again Christian, and he has that big sticker on the back of his car. What are you going to say in response to that? You're going to have to say, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think he is a, yeah, he is a miserable sinner. And the person said, well, I thought then uh, that if he was a Christian that he wouldn't be a miserable sinner. And you have to say, no, he is a miserable sinner who's a Christian. And uh, this is the story of grace, that God saves miserable sinners. And apparently this guy is a little slow off the mark on some of the things. <laughs> and uh, you ought to be encouraged by this because you too are a miserable sinner, and uh, God saves miserable sinners. As opposed to, oh no, he's a really nice guy. You just met him. You know, he's not good on Tuesdays, but uh, if, you ever, if you ever go on a business trip with him on a Wednesday, he's a fine fellow. Oh no, no, he reads his Bible. He's a nice, yeah, never kicks the cat, nice to his wife. So what we're trying to do is now come up with a basis of acceptability that is not the gospel. The only acceptability of that miserable sinner is in the gospel. He knows that when he looks at the mirror and sees himself. What is he? He's a miserable sinner saved by grace. Now, he has no justification for going out and being a miserable sinner with his friends and colleagues, and it is a royal disgrace when his pagan friends are actually a lot kinder and a lot nicer than he is. But that is actually a testimony to the fact of the nature of the gospel. So, humility. There's one for a start, huh? No, I am not conceited, said the man, although I have every right to be so. Why don't you... Why don't you read my new book, Humility and How I Attained It? <laughs> I got two quotes for you on humility. This is from an article in the Wall Street, September 18th, by Eric Felton, entitled, Apology Not Accepted. Apology Not Accepted. And the article was about people who make public apologies. Classically, you've got it in Letterman in the last, in the last week, okay? There's no admission of sin, nothing at all, just a bunch of clowning around and joking. So, hey, guess what? Apology not accepted. The governor of South Carolina, Mark Sanford, in admitting adultery with his Argentinian girlfriend, says Felton concerning the attempt at an apology by this governor, quotes, Even in his moment of self-reproach, the governor was impressed with his own importance. And then here's the sentence. Humbling oneself isn't exactly the same thing as humility. Humbling oneself isn't exactly the same thing as humility. Here's David Wells' definition of humility from Losing Our Virtue, page 204. Humility has nothing to do with depreciating ourselves and our gifts in ways we know to be untrue. Even humble attitudes can be masks for pride. Humility is that freedom from ourself which enables us to be in positions in which we have neither recognition nor importance, neither power nor validity, and even experience deprivation, and yet have joy and delight. It is the freedom of knowing that we are not at the center of the universe, not even in the center of our own private universe. It's an amazing point of application, isn't it? Titus, I want you to I make absolutely sure that you stress these things. These are profitable. These are excellent things. It is vital that these people are grounded in the gospel, both in terms of their own security, but also in terms of their impact in community, so that they will be careful. 
to be devoted to doing whatever is good. While our time hastens to a conclusion, you will notice that he then goes to tell him in verse 9 of what he's also to avoid. If he is to affirm certain things, he's also to avoid other, other things. And what he wants him to avoid is foolish controversies, genealogies, and arguments and quarrels about the law, because in contrast to the gospel, those things are, you will notice at the end of verse 8, excellent and profitable, and these things are unprofitable and useless. Mindless, pointless quarreling over stuff that has a peculiar interest for warped individuals. These false teachers that he's already referenced in chapter 1 were apparently very good at embroidering and supplementing the law of God. They were more apt at mythology than they were at theology. They were better at producing human concoctions than obeying God's commands. They were capable of developing genealogies. They took names out of the Old Testament books, and then they created a whole genealogy around those names, and then they had them added into some of the religious books. And then they had these huge discussions about the nature of these bogus genealogies. It was kind of like a sort of Old Testament version of the Loch Ness Monster, just with a touch of, with a touch of spice added to it. And as a result of this, they sought to distract and to divert by lengthy debates, and the debates were all about dates and all about definitions. Now, tell me you haven't met any of these people. Thank you. By your silence, you tell me you have. Is this intriguing? Perhaps. Is it edifying? Not for a moment. Not for a moment. If you have a peculiar bent in your mind, you may be interested in some of the stuff— Hopefully, none of you have sent me this stuff that comes routinely to me via Truth For Life. Someone sent me something just the other day explaining that they had cracked the code of a particular uh, book, and that this is, is now being done by this individual using a very uh, interesting logarithmic uh, uh, proposal, and he wanted me to make sure that I paid careful attention to it so that I could let you and other people like you know uh, uh, that, th that someone has now finally understood the book. Well, I... I, I filed that, and, um, and, uh, and not in the same place that I've been filing these B.B. Warfield quotes. No, you see, these people cannot be tolerated. The word that he uses for them is that they are to be muzzled. Muzzled. Put a muzzle on them, he says. Don't let them come around and flap their mouths. It's not very politically correct. We're so, we're so messed up now that anybody that says anything like this is immediately regarded as some horribly offensive person. No. I mean, have you been bitten by a dog lately? I was bitten by a dog just a summer ago. Big boxer dog jumped up, tore my shirt, bit me, scared me half to death. And I said, you know, why don't you put a muzzle on that dog? There wasn't nothing unkind about it. I don't want to beat the dog with a stick. But I sure don't want it just to jump up and bite me like that. That's scary. And he doesn't want these people jumping around the congregations in Crete, biting people, devouring people, getting them all off track. And so he says, just muzzle them up. Make sure that you silence them, because they are insubordinate, they're empty-headed, and they're deceitful. And so they must be silenced. The word that he uses, peristasso, to avoid these controversies and the people who bring them, is the word that simply means to turn the other way to turn your back on them. Avoid them at all costs. Don't get sucked into these things. Now, it's interesting. Somebody asked me this morning, do you think you're getting crankier in your old age? Um, I don't know that I can get much crankier, to tell you the honest truth, but it's possible. But I hope not. And one of the areas that I'm trying to learn is in this very area, because there's hardly an occasion passes where I go anywhere, and not least of all preach in the congregation here, without somebody comes up afterwards, after you have endeavored to discharge the duties of your ministry, to lay out the truth of the Bible and everything, someone comes up, and they've got some harebrained scheme or idea that uh, they have developed from somewhere or whatever else it might be. And instinctively, I want to say something that I probably shouldn't say, and so I'm working hard at, at, at not doing that. But it's hard. One of my great mentors, uh, a retired clergyman in the Anglican Church now, is masterful at it, and he can actually take two or three opinions and, and uh, say yes to all of them and never let anybody get him ruffled. 
He's got that wonderful English phlegmatic approach to life. The trouble is when you're a Celt, you're not blessed with that. You don't have that as part of you want to stay. I'll, I'll, let me tell you what I think of that idea, you know, and, and so on. But he, he's wonderful, you know, and, and he's made a career out of it. He walks around with a coffee cup. I love telling my colleagues this. He'll have his coffee cup at the end of the service. He's just walking around, and someone will come up to him and say, you know, Mr. Lucas, I, uh, I noticed that uh, you, you, uh, you were uh, not as uh, expositional as I thought you ought to have been. You, uh, you seem to be far more um, involved in, in systematic theology, and, and I, think, I think you really ought to just uh, watch out for that. And he said, oh, thank you, thank you. I will pay attention to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then he just walk off and just leave him. And he bumps into a fellow over here. The fellow over here says, Mr. Lucas, this is the second time I've come here, and I, you know, I noticed that uh, you seem to be far more expositional, and uh, you're not really paying much attention to uh, systematic uh, uh, theology at all in the way you're teaching the Bible. He said, oh, thank you so much. That's a wonderful observation. Thank you. I must remember that as well. And then he just refused to be drawn into to the nonsense. There's great skill in that. Maybe when I'm 83, I can do that as well. <laughs> now, we have to stop, but this is in keeping with what Paul says elsewhere. We would expect there to be a uh, uh, a synergy between what Paul is writing to other places and this. So, for example, in Romans 16, he says, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of of naive people. These are the kind, he says when he writes to Timothy, these are the kind of people who worm their way into the homes of women who are weak-willed and pressed. Now, that is not a generic statement regarding all women, but it is a designation of a certain kind of woman within the context of Ephesus who were weak in their will and who were easy prey for these charlatans. And he says there is, no, there is no way in the world that this must be allowed to continue. And therefore, I want you to watch out, and I want you to warn a divisive person once and then a second time, and after that have nothing to do with him. The word that is used there for warn is the Greek word which gives us our English word nuthetic, from which we get nuthetic counseling. It is the verb, uh, that, uh, the exact same verb that is used in Ephesians 6, for what fathers are to do. They are not to exasperate their children, but they are to bring them up in the training or the admonition of the Lord. The same word is used there, nuthesian. So, in other words, the warning that is referenced here is a warning. It's not a threat. He says, I want you to point out to this individual the implication of wrong actions— with the purpose of seeing them embrace right actions. Says Donald Guthrie, if this action, however, should seem rather harsh, Titus must recognize that the stubbornness of the man is evidence of a perverted mind. And so, in other words, this individual, such a man, is warped and sinful— and by his actions, he will be seen to be so. And Titus, by his actions, will be seen to be concerned for the welfare of the church. I'm tempted to suggest that what we have here is another sterling reminder of what has become for some of us almost a mantra, namely, that the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. And to be diverted and distracted and deceived by chasing down these avenues, says Paul, is something that must not happen. And the leadership of the church, in this instance, in the case of Titus, must be prepared to be totally clear concerning the gospel, absolutely certain in the things that he stresses. 
and aware of the fact that any authority that is his is an authority that is grounded in the truth of God's Word, which he's been given to proclaim, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, who enables him to do so. So let us heed this instruction for the good of the church and for the glory of God. Our God and our Father, I suppose we could have chosen something that would have been a lot easier to handle than this, a lot cozier. But here we are, under the searching gaze of your truth. And so we pray that the clarity with which Paul communicates to Titus may arrest our thinking, that the certainty with which Titus engages in his pastoral ministry may become something of a hallmark for all who are involved in the leadership and teaching and training of others, and that the sense of authority may always and only be seen to be an authority which is a derived authority and isn't found in personality or in human giftedness, but is, as with our very acceptance before you, found in Christ alone. Hear our prayers, O God, as we think of our own congregations from which we've come, as we think of the needs of the church throughout the nation, as we think about all that tomorrow will bring in places that are represented here in this room right now. And we pray for the success and for the well-being and for the very clarity and certainty to be the identifying features of those who open up the truth of your word so that men and women might know Christ and may love Christ, and that together we might be ready and careful to devote ourselves to doing what is good. For we pray, seeking the forgiveness of all of our sins, in Christ's name. Amen. an important message about handling debates and divisions within the church. You're listening to Truth For Life Weekend with Alistair Begg and a message from a series titled For Goodness Sake. Maybe as you were listening today, you thought of someone you'd like to share this message with, maybe a pastor or an elder who could use some encouragement as they lead your church. In any case, you can send a link to this program when you go to truthforlife.org. And while you're there, you can also purchase the complete series on CD or DVD at our cost to produce. There's no markup. We love providing resources that help you grow in your knowledge of God's Word. And every month, we select books to recommend to you to help supplement what you're learning in this program. Right now, our featured resource is a captivating biography of a man whose life was dedicated to the work of the gospel. His name was George Whitfield. Whitfield once famously said, The whole world is now my parish. Wheresoever my master calls me, I am ready to go and preach the everlasting gospel. That's a great way for all of us to think. He was an ordinary, unordained Englishman who played a crucial role in sparking the Protestant revival in the 18th century. He preached throughout Britain and in North America, touching the lives of countless men and women from every part of society. But sadly today, most people have never heard of Whitfield. That's the reason we're recommending this biography, to encourage your faith as you read about God's work in Whitfield's life. Learn how to request George Whitfield, God's anointed servant, when you visit us online at truthforlife.org. Again, that's truthforlife.org. If you'd prefer to mail a donation to us, write to Truth For Life at P.O. Box 39 Cleveland, Ohio, 44139. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you'll join us next weekend as Alistair continues our study in Titus called For Goodness Sake. This program and the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life, where the learning is for living.